Sue for our virtual Earth Day celebration. I hope everyone's having a good day so far. I hope you had a good Earth, way, uh, Earth Week. So Earth Day was actually on Thursday, April 22nd, but we're celebrating just a couple days late so that way more people are able to join us in our Earth Day celebration. Now, my name is Kristen. I'm one of the educators here at Reed Park Zoo. I'm so happy that you guys were able to join us for Earth Day. And with me, I have Kaniki. Kaniki is a sulfur crested cockatoo, and he's here to help me explain why the Earth is so important, why we should work to protect it. So we have a very fun day ahead of us. Um, you probably are aware of the schedule, but I'm just going to give it a reminder just in case. Throughout the day today, until about two o'clock, we'll have presentations every 30 minutes. We'll be visiting the giraffe habitat with my coworker, Brittany, at uh, 10.30. Then we'll be going to Lion at 11. We'll check out our new pollinator garden at 11.30, the flamingo habitat at 12. And at 12.30, we'll come back here to meet some of our smaller animals. And then we'll go to our jaguar habitat at one. And then we'll come back here again at 1.30 um, to kind of wrap up and get a chance to continue our Earth Day celebrations going all year long. Now, if you have followed our events page, either on our events page or on our Facebook, you may know that we've been celebrating all week um, with activities that you can do from home. So hopefully you guys have been able to join us with the, some of those activities. If not, we welcome you to do it today, tomorrow, next month, next year, whenever. One of the great activities we have highlighted on our website is build a bee home. So I'm gonna move this closer to the camera. So you have build a bee home. This is an example of a bee home that was made using cardboard paper or cardboard tubes and a coffee can. And this actually provides home to solitary mason bees, which are bees that are native to here in the Sonoran Desert. So each little tube will be used by an individual bee, provides home for a lot of different important pollinators. And we'll learn more about pollinators later. Now, for those of you who have registered on our website for this event, you have been entered into our plant giveaway. Please know that um, at the end, we'll um, email everybody um, about that plant giveaway. We have some wonderful native plants that have been donated from Nighthawk Natives Nursery. So now we'll talk a little bit more about the real star of the show because he's very interested in everything going on. Now I mentioned how important it is for us to protect the planet. So as a zoo that's a part of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we work with other zoos around the country to save animals. One way that we do that is by having a virtual party for the planet. Hello, sir, I know you really wanna be the star of the show. So our Party for the Planet is an AZA initiative. It's something that all AZA zoos are working very hard to do together to help have a bigger impact. And we invite all of you guys to do the same. So while we're visiting some different animal habitats today, we're gonna focus on SAFE species. And SAFE stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. Different AZA zoos work with conservation experts out in the field and also with their guests to help protect animals that live around the world. We definitely want to get involved in that because we want to help protect wild animals and the wild places they live. So Kaniki here is a rainforest bird. He lives in the trees. And one way we can help make sure there's a healthy planet, not only for us, but also birds like Kaniki is helping to make sure that we try to save paper and make sure our products are sustainably harvested. We'll learn more about that as we go through the day. So at this point, since Kaniki is very interested in everything that is going on, I want to see if there's any questions before we get started with our events. So any questions that have come through the chat. In the meantime, we'll watch Kaniki use his wonderful beak. It's very powerful. He can actually bite through nuts and seeds with that beak. And right now he's stripping bamboo with it one of his favorite things to do. Kristen, I so don't it have- it seems like there are no questions coming through right now. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys again a little bit later. If you have any questions at any time, you can certainly put them in the chat. 
we are going to kind of go dark, as it were, until our 1030 giraffe presentation. You're welcome to stay um, in this link, or if you'd like, you can come back and join us at 1030 at our giraffe habitat. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Bodies, this is also going to give us the opportunity to get up close, again, build those bonds, make sure we have that trust in place, and also encourage our animals to move in natural ways also encouraging them to potentially move to a spot where we would need them to. Right in front of you here, you see that we have one of the front feet of our giraffe up on that box. That is the start of x-ray training. As I mentioned earlier, x-raying feet is a really, really important part of their care. So by introducing new things that could potentially be a little bit startling to such a large prey animal, we are able to slowly introduce this, get them used to it, and through that positive reinforcement, through building their confidence and building their trust, we are able to work up to behaviors like doing that x-ray training and eventually for them probably doing blood draw training as well. Our oldest female giraffe, Denver, at 32 years old is the second oldest giraffe in an AZA institution. And she participates in voluntary blood draws. Not only do we wanna see the entire outside of our animal to make sure that everything is working and moving properly, we also wanna be able to look inside. So by doing those x-rays, by taking that blood work, we are able to do those kinds of things and catch anything before it becomes a problem. Now at their age, at two years old and one years old respectively, these two are still just getting started. They're just learning everything new that they would need in order to be able to participate in all of their training, but they're already doing really, really well. Giraffe naturally are going to be a very cautious animal. So building this trust is very important for making sure that we are able to provide that whole life care. And as they continue to get older and advanced, they've got all of these great base behaviors that they're going to be able to build off of. Now it does take a little bit of work and a little bit of timing to make sure that we are getting them where we need them to be and that they are comfortable and confident. Because as you can imagine, being the tallest thing out there, it is a little bit tough sometimes to know exactly where your feet are. So they have to learn by feeling, they have to learn by watching their keeper, and they have to learn to kind of look around them in order to assess what's going on and make sure that that box is not something scary. It's something perfectly safe for them to step on. Now, since we are spending some time here today talking about the Safe Species Program, if you were here at the very beginning, Kristen introduced you to the Saving Animals from Extinction program. Now, giraffe in the wild are facing what is called a silent extinction. They have experienced approximately a 40% decline in their population. And there's not necessarily a lot of information, a lot being put out there about it. So we wanna make sure that we can help out with that. We want to stop the extinction and you are going to be a part of that. We want you to share your love for giraffe Make sure that you tell your friends and family all about them because the more people appreciate them, the more likely they are to care. And making sure that more people know what's going on with giraffe is a huge step in ensuring that we can preserve their habitat for the future. Now, the reason that they are experiencing the silent extinction is actually kind of threefold. So unfortunately, in their habitat home ranges, they are experiencing habitat loss as humans encroach farther and farther into their spaces. They are also dealing with the effects of climate change. Droughts are getting longer, and it is harder for them to be able to find the food and the water they need in order to survive. The other thing that they are dealing with is poaching, so illegal hunting of wildlife. All three of those things are very critical factors for a number of different species out there, not just giraffe, but giraffe right now do absolutely need our help. You can also help participate, not just by talking about how much you love giraffe, but also by being able to support different organizations, by attending Reed Park Zoo coming here, some of your admission money does go towards conservation funding. And when we have them safely again, you can participate in the Giraffe Encounter and our Quarters for Conservation program. Both of those programs are on hold at the moment due to COVID-19. However, all of that money goes to various conservation organizations around the world, including Africa, where reticulated giraffes come from. You can also though make a donation directly through our website or when you arrive here at the zoo, we can take your donations then. We support organizations such as the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. So they are one of those organizations that would benefit from any type of conservation funding. And they are some of the ones doing the hardest work out there on the ground. They're making sure that they work with local communities to give them the tools necessary, the training necessary to help giraffe in their home ranges. By learning how to live alongside animals and learning how to protect their habitat and preserve it for the future, 
not only are they helping those animals and any other animal that lives in the area, but they can also help themselves and they can empower their communities to be stronger. Now, as we continue to watch our giraffe here, we do wanna highlight some of their features because they are absolutely gorgeous animals. You have probably been able to observe some of their incredible adaptations, including, of course, those very iconic long necks. And with me, I do have a model of one of our giraffe neck bones. So this is one single vertebrae. It is not an actual neck bone. This is a model of one. The real thing is rather heavy and can be pretty fragile, but this is what it would look like in a full grown adult. Now giraffe have seven neck bones. We do as well, we also have seven, but ours are considerably smaller. So there is a substantial difference between these two. That is because of the different adaptations required to be able to survive. We as humans do not need to stretch our necks up into the trees for food, but giraffes do. So that is why over time they have developed everything in their bodies to be long and adapted for reaching high up into the trees. You might have noticed with our giraffe training here today, some of the things we ask them to do are to stretch their necks up. And occasionally you might see them stick that tongue out as well. It is a little bit of a cheat on their part to try and touch the target stick with their tongue rather than their nose, but that tongue comes in handy. They do that for a reason. That is what they are going to primarily be using to grab a hold of branches and leaves way up in the trees. And that 18 inch long tongue is going to give them the advantage over almost every other animal in the African savanna. It pays to be tall when you live in one of the wide open habitats that doesn't necessarily have a ton of trees, so you can reach higher than just about everybody else. Now, as we enjoy the end of our training session here, as our keepers are probably getting ready to wrap up, I'm gonna go ahead and pause and see if we have had any questions come through. Yes, Brittany, we have had a couple. I'm not sure, hopefully you can hear me. Um, you talked a little bit about Denver, um, one of our other giraffes. Did we talk about where she is today? Absolutely. So Denver is currently inside the barn. She is enjoying just a little bit of extra sleeping in time if she's choosing to sleep, which is probably not the case because giraffe do only sleep for about 20 minutes to an hour every single day. But since we are working very hard with our youngsters to build their confidence and work on some of these behaviors, it's nice for them to have their own training time with their keepers. With Denver and Jasiri out, they are much, much larger, much more dominant, and much more familiar with this whole process. So having them out here, the babies will probably get a little bit intimidated and pushed out of the way. So they get their own time and Denver and Jasiri are actually just on the other side of the window. I'm actually looking at one of them right now. <laughs> um, and then the other question, um, can you talk a little bit about why giraffes are going extinct? Absolutely. So there are a number of different reasons, unfortunately. It's not just one solution, but that's why we are so lucky to have conservation groups like Giraffe Conservation Foundation working so hard for this. They are experiencing habitat fragmentation and loss. So Giraffe Conservation Foundation has worked to be able to translocate herds of giraffe. There are some places where the habitat could sustain the giraffe, but they've been pushed out for any number of different reasons. So they are working to move giraffe back into their historical native homelands. There's another though big factor involved, which is climate change, and that is droughts. You can't necessarily change the habitat if the drought has claimed it. So sometimes you do have to wait for the rains to come back. You have to wait to work with your community and really build up everything that would be involved in trying to bring that habitat back to where it could be. But in certain other areas where maybe the climate is not going to be as severe, where they're not experiencing quite as severe a drought, you might be able to move giraffe into that area. Certainly poaching is also a factor. It is not necessarily going to be the biggest of the factors, but it is still one that giraffes face. They are poached for their hides and for souvenirs such as part, different parts of their bodies. And any other questions we might have? Thank you, Brittany. Um, I do not have any more, oh, another question just popped up. Um, is the poaching as bad as it is with elephants? Is the, I didn't quite catch that. Is the poaching as bad as it is with elephants? Not necessarily. So with elephants, we are seeing poaching of an average of 96 animals per day. We are not quite seeing that with giraffe, which is really, really good because their numbers are going to be a little bit more threatened, but elephants are seeing a very steep decline. Giraffes are not necessarily seeing as steep a decline, but their numbers are not necessarily as large. So right now we are seeing a more significant poaching due to ivory, but for giraffe, it is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be their hides and their tails primarily. And at least as of right now, not quite as frequent or not quite as many individuals. Still a very substantial threat though. 
Uh, thank you so much, Brittany. That was all the questions that we had in our chat for this session. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. We will be popping back on here at 11 a.m. at our lion habitat. So we'll go dark here for just a little bit and we'll see you again shortly. Recognize where we are. If you have not, hopefully you see one of the animals kind of sort of sneaking up behind me right now and recognize them as being lions. Now, lions do also have a SAFE program. So if you did not join us earlier, SAFE is our Saving Animals from Extinction AZA initiative that is seeking to help some of the most endangered and critically endangered animals out there. Now, with the SAFE program for African lions, the Lion Recovery Fund is a huge part of making sure that these incredibly iconic animals have a future in their home range. Unfortunately, similarly to giraffes, lions have undergone something of a silent extinction. In the years since the Lion King, Disney's Lion King was first released in 1994, lions have seen a drastic decline in their population. And there's only about an 8% of their range that is covered by lions to this day. So over their entire historic range, they only take up a fraction of it now. And Lion Recovery Fund is seeking to double the lion population by 2050. So that is their goal. Now, what you are seeing behind me right now is a training session with our two female lions. We have Kaya and Neo here at our zoo. We also have our male Tony. He is in the back right now because the lions are dictating how they are being introduced to each other. What's really cool is we are letting them set the pace. We wanna make sure that everything goes well and everybody is perfectly ready to introduce to each other and meet each other. They are able to see each other in their night house. They can smell each other, but they do not have direct contact just yet. And that is to keep everybody safe. So today we are working with our two females. We have our female Kaya on the left and her daughter on the right, if I double check myself here. And Neo was born here at Reed Park Zoo. So she does get to stay with her mom. Lions in the wild would live in a pride. They are going to spend their entire lifetime with all of the related females living together. And males will kind of come and go over the period of a few years. So the biggest, strongest males that are going to be able to run a pride and keep that pride's territory are usually going to be the ones that unfortunately are targeted by trophy hunters. So one of the things that Lion Recovery Fund is seeking to help with is making sure that there is less retali retaliatory killing of lions for any interactions with livestock that they may have, and also a reduction in that trophy hunting. We wanna make sure that these populations remain strong. There's a reason why the biggest, strongest males are able to run a pride. And we wanna make sure that those genetics, that those different types of strengths that they have are going to live into future populations and future generations. Now, just like with our giraffe, this is positive reinforcement training that you are seeing. Everything is up to the lions. It is always their choice to participate. We would never tell a carnivore or any large animal what they should and should not do at any given time. It is going to be up to them. And for at least the larger animals, including our carnivores, including some of our bigger predators, we are going to make sure that there's always a barrier between us and them. So if you joined us for a giraffe, you will have noticed that our keeper stayed on one side of the fence and the giraffe stayed on the other. The same is true for our lions, but our lions have a little bit more robust fence. We wanna make sure that no part of our lion comes through to our side and no part of our keeper goes through to their side. These are still animals that rely very heavily on their instincts. They are still incredibly powerful. Females can weigh over 300 pounds. Our two females are hovering close to about 400 pounds and males can weigh a little over 500. So these are very, very large, powerful cats. We wanna be respectful of that. In doing their positive reinforcement training, we wanna look at different parts of their body, including, at least for our lions, inside of their mouths. So what you are seeing right there is our female Kaya standing up on her hind legs, giving us a really great look at all of her joints, making sure her belly is looking good. We can also get on eye level with her face, which is a really great thing to be able to look inside of that mouth. Teeth is going, are going to be some of the critical aspects of making sure that an animal is able to eat. So maintaining their dental health, just like we go to the dentist, is a very important thing. We are able to look at our animal's teeth every single day and catch problems before they become something more serious. So our keepers are actually able to look inside and check and see what kind of plaque buildup they might be seeing, if there are any cracks, if there's anything going on with their gums. So that way we can bring in a specialist to help take care of anything else that might be going on. You may have also seen as we're watching our two lions here that they occasionally are putting their paws up on the fence. Now, sometimes they offer that up just because it is a behavior that they know. 
So they will offer that just to see if their keepers will take that from them and if they'll receive a reward for doing so. Now, if it's not a behavior they were asked for, it's no big deal. Our keepers will just pause, give them a moment to think about it, and then try again and ask them to do something else. But sometimes we are looking to get their pause. We are asking for them to show those to us because we wanna check their paw pads. We wanna check their overall health, make sure those paw pads are not cracking or getting any kind of stickers or anything inside of them that would be uncomfortable for our cats to walk on. We can also evaluate their claw health because just like other cats, claws are going to be a very important part of being able to scratch, set mark their territory, catch food items. And for here at the zoo, they are going to be catching enrichment items. So they're gonna be able to play with different toys and they use their claws and their teeth very heavily to do that. Now, if you can hear it, I'm not sure you're able to pick it up on my microphone, but every once in a while, you might hear the keeper saying the word good. If you joined us for our giraffe presentation a little bit ago, you might've heard some whistling going on. So every time you either hear the word good or you hear that sharp whistle sound, that is the sound that tells our lions they did exactly what was asked of them. With positive reinforcement training, Again, it's always up to them, but we are making sure that we are communicating with our animals. So we want to let them know what they did right exactly when they did it. And by using a consistent sound every single time, that bridge captures the moment that they did something good and connects it to the food reward that they are about to receive. Now you might notice that one of our cats hopped away for just a moment there, something might have startled her and that is perfectly okay. She is allowed to do that and allowed to make the choice to come back. It is, again, always up to them to be able to decide what they want to do and when they want to do it. We run on animal time here at the zoo, so they are going to let us know when they are ready to participate and when they're not. And if there's something in their habitat that they're not sure about, we want to be respectful of that as well. They are relying on their instincts just as much here as they would in the wild. Here, though, they just don't have to worry about all of the same kinds of things. In the wild, wild lions do sleep very frequently and they are going to sleep for most of their day, but they're not necessarily going to get the deep sleep that they would here at our zoo because they have to worry about other lions, other threats, and unfortunately a lot of times humans are going to be one of those threats. But reserving all of your energy and sleeping 18 to 22 hours a day is a really great way to use all of that pent-up explosive energy for when you need it, which is going to be during a hunt. Now our cats are going to receive their food throughout the day either during these training sessions first thing in the morning when our keepers go to check on them or at the very end of the day. So we are going to provide them all of their food kind of in stages. They don't have to worry about catching it all and eating it all at once. And both females are very alert right now. They're kind of paying attention to some different things in the habitat. So they're using their senses to determine what's going on around them. They do have very good eyesight and very good hearing and a pretty well-developed sense of smell. It's certainly all much stronger than our senses are, so they're gonna be able to pick up on things that we may not even be paying attention to. I will enjoy the training session here for just a couple of moments and maybe answer some questions before we move on to some other lion information. Um, we don't really have any questions right now, Brittany, um, but uh, we just had one pop up. Uh, how old is uh, Tony, the male lion? So Tony is five years old and he came to us from San Antonio Zoo. All right, it looks like our keepers have wrapped up their training session, at least for the moment. So our females are gonna wander away and I am going to wander back on camera to show you some of those amazing adaptations that they have up close. Now we do have a model of a lion claw right here. So as I mentioned, claws are a pretty important part of being a cat. They need to be able to catch and hold their prey. So these claws are going to sit in between, it's kind of hard to do it on a human. So their claws will sit kind of in the middle of a toe and they're able to retract their claws fully into their paws. That is going to allow the claws to stay sharp for when they need them. They will also sharpen them and um, wear off some of that sheath that's on the outside by scratching on trees. But by retracting those claws, they reserve those incredibly sharp points for exactly the moment when they're going to need them to catch prey. They also, have those very large teeth. Now, again, this is a model. These are all models that we're showing you today. This tooth, you would see probably about that much of it sticking out of the lion's gums. So they are very, very large teeth. And those teeth have to be incredibly powerful to take down some pretty large prey. Lions can take down things as large as Cape Buffalo, which are about 2,000 pounds if they're one of the big bulls. A very strong, very large lion pride will sometimes try to take on even young elephant calves or giraffe as well. 
Now, this is an example of what happens to some of the enrichment here at our zoo when the lions get to it. Now, this used to be a solid piece of red plastic. It is no longer a solid piece of red plastic, and it's all because of the teeth and claws of our lions getting to play with it. And this, all of this damage happens in usually less than 15 minutes. This is one of their absolute favorite enrichment items. So we do enjoy giving these to them. And one of the ways that you can actually help us out with that is during our enrichment tree celebration every year during the holidays. So we do get a lot of these and we appreciate all of you who donate to our enrichment tree program. This is one of their absolute favorites. So you can see how well loved it is. This is not something that we would be able to take apart with our teeth and our fingernails, but a lion can do it without any trouble whatsoever. Now getting back to lion conservation, if again, you joined us for our giraffe program just a little bit ago, you probably heard us mention that just by coming to the zoo, you are helping us support conservation organizations. And that is absolutely 100% true for lions as well. Every organization we support is not only focused on the specific flagship animal, so the one that might be in their name, but it also supports everybody else who might live in that area. So the Lion Recovery Fund benefits from any other conservation organization protecting habitat, because lions are facing habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Just like giraffe, their story unfortunately is very similar. You will hear that a lot today with the different things that we are talking about. Habitat loss and deforestation, habitat fragmentation, climate change, poaching, human encroachment. These are all things that face animals all around the world. And we are doing our part to try and help prevent that from continuing to happen. We want the lion population in the wild to be able to double by 2050. We want our giraffe population to be able to go back to their native habitats. We want to see these wonderful, amazing animals back in their ecosystem. And just by joining us today, you are all helping with that. Every single time you come to the zoo, your money does go to those conservation organizations. If you participate in our giraffe encounter, once we get that back online, or if you've participated in the past, thank you. That is a huge part of what we are able to do monetarily to support these organizations. Now, if you are looking to donate directly to certain organizations, you can do that through our website, or you can go to the websites of the organizations we mentioned today. With our lions, again, that is the Lion Recovery Fund. And with our giraffe, that is the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. And with that, I will pause again to see if we've had any more questions come through. Um, Brittany, is there a breeding recommendation for our lions? And um, how many lions do we currently have? That is a great question. So at this point in time, we do not have a breeding recommendation for our females and our male. Tony though is still a very important part of the species survival plan. So all three of our cats here are a part of that. And even if they're not breeding, they are still a critical part because Tony was able to come to us to allow room for some other lions to make their moves to different zoos. We wanna make sure that our genetics in all of the different zoos are strong. We wanna make sure that we are pairing animals appropriately to continue their generations and to make sure that everybody stays healthy. I am here at Reef Park Zoo's new pollinator garden and we're going to talk a little bit more about the wildlife that we find close to home. So you had a chance to meet with Brittany earlier where we learned about giraffes and lions and the importance of protecting animals that live all over the world. But here we have wildlife that we share our very own Sonoran Desert with. And here I am in our pollinator garden where we have some native plants that allow native pollinators such as bees, but also butterflies, beetles, flies, and other types of pollinators help to pollinate. So behind me, we have some globe mallow, these beautiful deep pink flowers, next to some chocolate flower, these daisy looking flowers here. Now we have a lot of different types of native plants here in our pollinator garden, because we partner with the Monarch Safe and the North American Songbird Safe. And one of the best ways to help protect not only pollinators, but also birds that we share our homes with is by planting native plants. So here at Reed Park Zoo, we have done just that with some globe mellow, some chocolate flower. We'll come over this way where we see some butterfly milkweed, pine leaf milkweed, and some, um, let's see, Indian, Indian fire wheel flower. So um, these are some different plants that are found right here around the Sonoran Desert region. Now we're really lucky where we live because not only is there desert in the Sonoran Desert region, but we also have mountains, we have grasslands, and we have riparian areas. 
So the Southeast uh, Arizona is actually one of the most diverse places for pollinators and birds. Now, a lot of times when people think about pollinators, they think about honeybees. Honeybees are what we see pretty often. That's usually what beekeepers use in order to produce honey. And honeybees do create hives. They're a social bee. But we have a lot of different types of native bees that live here in the Sonoran Desert. And native bees are usually solitary. So you can help to provide food for not only those honeybees, but also the thousand different species of native bees, since honeybees were actually introduced to North America in the 1600s. They're not naturally found here. So we wanna support the native bees that we share this home with also. And if you look to the back of this habitat, I'm gonna move along. You'll see we have a bee house here for mason bees. Mason bees are one of the solitary native bees here in the Sonoran Desert. So each of these little holes can be used by a separate bee, another, a separate female who will lay her egg and forage for her young. She'll produce that nectar and bring that nectar and pollen to this hole for her larva or baby to eat from as it hatches from its egg. You can also create your own native bee houses. I'm gonna move this closer to us. We're probably zoomed in a little bit, but this is one you can make at home. Even if you don't have woodworking tools to make that big bee post that I just showed you. So this is using a coffee can and some cardboard tubes like to toilet paper tubes or paper towel tubes. And it also creates those little cavities for the mason bees to make their nests. Now there's other types of native bees as well. Some of those bees actually the best place for their homes are in loose dirt. So if you look at our pollinator garden, we have lots of different plants, but we also have a lot of bare ground. That bare ground is on purpose. It would be great to put flowers everywhere, but then there wouldn't be that bare ground that other solitaries meet, solitary bees need for their home. Now, I did mention butterflies and how important it is to provide habitat for butterflies. Now we have a lot of different butterflies that live here in the Sonoran Desert, but one of the absolute iconic butterflies that most people think of is the monarch butterfly. And monarch butterflies are really specific in what they need to survive. So like other butterflies, they're able to collect nectar from different flowers, but they rely on milkweed plants to raise their young. That's the only thing their caterpillars can eat. So we actually provide a lot of different types of milkweed here in this pollinator garden, that butterfly milkweed, the pine leaf milkweed, and also uh, Arizona milkweed are all very important to make sure there's lots of food sources for those monarch caterpillars. Now, caterpillars or monarchs in general have been declining over recent years. Here in Southern Arizona, we're really lucky because we are a little bit more unique for the population of monarchs that live here. If you are from the East Coast, you might be familiar with monarchs that travel down into Mexico to winter, to overwinter. It's where they spend their winter time. Here in Southern Arizona, some of our monarchs go to Mexico for the winter. Some go to the coast of California and some stay right here. We have some monarchs here year round. So we're actually learning a lot about the monarchs here in the Southwest by partnering with the Southwest Monarch Study in addition to the Monarch SAFE program. Now the Monarch SAFE program, again, SAFE stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. It's an initiative from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. It works together with a lot of different monarch conservation groups and everyday people just like you and I, community scientists working together to help protect habitat for monarchs. And one of the best ways to protect habitat for monarchs is by planting milkweed. Now, sometimes when people move into a house or an apartment, they want to plant the most beautiful flowers they can find. Sometimes that means they're planting non-native flowers, flowers that aren't normally found here. So the animals, such as those pollinators that rely on native plants, don't have the food they need to survive. So by working together, we can help provide a lot of monarch habitat by all planting milkweed. Now, even if you live in an apartment, you can do that. 
And one thing that we can also do is make our voices known. The Monarch Safe has worked with those Monarch groups and also local cities and even state governments to help provide Monarch habitat alongside roadways. So when you're driving around, um, when it's safe to do so and you're traveling again, take a look at the roadside. See if you see butterfly habitat because we really can have a big role if we work together, not just you and I in our own yards here at the zoo, but also by working together for all the places that we share a home with. So that's a little bit about the monarch safe and how important milkweeds are for monarchs. But I did mention that we also partner with the North American Songbird Safe. You guys may hear some bird sounds in the background. This pollinator garden is also home to some of the songbirds that we know and love, things like finches and warblers and sparrows. Now, some of those species are disappearing. We have actually lost 3 billion birds in the last 30 years. And one way that we can help make sure that all of the birds we enjoy hearing and seeing every single day have a healthy home is to also plant natives. So we're helping pollinators and we're helping those North American songbirds. Another thing you can do, if you have big, beautiful windows to look out on this beautiful home that we have, you can put decals on those windows because sometimes birds don't understand reflections and they think they can fly through your window. Of course, that doesn't always end well for the bird. One other thing you can do to help protect North American songbirds is keeping cats indoors. Cats are very, very good predators. They are able to hunt and sometimes they may hunt some of those local birds that we know and love so much. I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Um, we'll do another look at our pollinator garden first because there are so many beautiful flowers. I do wanna point out this butterfly milkweed. Now you may have noticed that there's lots of beautiful flowers on here, but this plant has also been pollinated. So it has been visited. I personally saw a monarch butterfly here just a week and a half ago, and it has pollinated some of these flowers. So they're actually producing these seeds and these seeds are windborne. So they'll actually fly. I'm going to hope that they don't fly off my hand while I try to show you guys. So this going to help that milkweed spread. Now, luckily it is a native species. That's another thing we have to consider when we put invasive or exotic non-native plants in our gardens, sometimes they find a way out into the natural world. And that can be very problematic. It's starting to blow off of my hand. That can be very problematic for the native species that are already here. So definitely consider planting native this spring. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for any questions. Um, so Kristen, you're saying a lot of native plants, but can you uh, maybe name a few specific plants if people were going to plant in their own gardens? Yes, so I definitely recommend at least a couple of milkweeds because we want to make sure there's a lot of habitat and food for those monarchs. So for example, this butterfly milkweed is a native milkweed. Also, we have pine leaf milkweed here. It does look kind of like a tiny little pine tree. We have Arizona milkweed right over here. And then we also have desert or rush milkweed elsewhere in the zoo. So all of those are native milkweed plants. It's very important that you don't plant um, non-native or invasive milkweed. Something like tropical milkweed actually may do well here, but it's not healthy for our native butterflies. So make sure you only plant native milkweed. Some other native plants that you can find to put in your own garden are these chocolate flowers over here. So these um, do kind of smell like chocolate. And then this globe mallow. So globe mallow can be in a couple of different colors. The globe mallow we have here is actually varied globe mallow. So there's some dark pink, light pink, and it also can be found in orange color. Um, and then there's, I'm just gonna see if we can maybe zoom in on some of our other native flowers here. So we also have, let's see, we'll move along here. We have some Paris penstemon. Those flowers are starting to, they've already been pollinated, so they're starting to produce fruits. But we have Paris penstemon. Over here, we do have some Greg's mist flowers. So all of these are natives. They can be from local nurseries and planted in your own garden, whether it's in a house or even your patio. 
So all of those flowers bring beautiful color straight to your home and they're native. So they provide habitat for all of the pollinators and other wildlife that share our home. Okay, great. Any Thank other you. questions that we've gotten? I have not gotten any other questions um, in the chat. So thank All right. You. Absolutely. So I hope you guys um, have had a chance to look at some of the activities that we have on our website and we've shared on our Facebook page because a lot of those activities do relate directly to the wildlife we have here in our backyard, such as that bee house or, or building or creating a bird feeder, beautifying an area and going out and just seeing who shares your backyard. It's all very exciting stuff and it helps to connect us not only to the whole planet that we share with these animals, but also the animals that we share our own yards with. Thank you guys um, so did, much. We'll, oh. oh, sorry, Kristen, we did get a couple of questions. I don't know if you still wanna go on or? Sure. Uh, so could you uh, explain a little bit about how pollination happens? And yes. um, are there, is there another flower a pollinator collects nectar? Is there an, another? There's a variety of flowers. So um, for every flowering plant out there, there's a pollinator who pollinates it. Um, we are highlighting mostly just the native plants here, but no matter where you live, you can actually learn about the native plants in your area by going to, to the National Audubon Society and typing in find your plants database, and you can type in your zip code and it tell you what species are found there. So it gives you a starting point. Now, as far as what is the process of pollination, I wish I had a flower model out here to show you, but we're gonna go ahead and move closer to a flower that you can actually see the different parts of. Sam, which flower are we looking at? So we're gonna look at the tufted evening primrose. I'm gonna work my way over there being very careful. All right. So if you are able to see this flower here, you may notice there's these petals. The petals are what let the pollinator know we have nectar here. Come here for some free food. And of course, it's not really free because when the bee or other pollinator comes up to this flower, they're gonna rub up against the anther of the flower, which is kind of these parts here, you might see they look a little fuzzy. That's actually the pollen. So the bee will rub against that anther and collect the pollen. Bees are pretty fuzzy. They have little hair like bristles all over their legs. And then when they move to another flower or even to the same flower, they may rub up against this part here. This is the pistil of the flower. And that is where the pollen is to. So it's a little bit sticky and the pollen will fall off the bee onto that pistil and it will move down this little tube here called a style and that's where the seed will develop. In some plants they'll, that seed will develop in a very very large fruit that even people like you and I can eat. Something like an apple or something even like a zucchini that we know of as a vegetable but really as far as plants are concerned, that is considered a fruit because it's around those seeds. So that is the process of pollination. The bee will come, rub up against those anthers, move along to other flowers, and then bump into that pistil where the pollen will move down that style and work to create a seed. So that is the process of pollination. I'm gonna move carefully back through. All right, have we gotten any other questions, Andrea? Uh, no, that, that is it. Perfect. Well, we're gonna um, see you guys again in just a little bit at our Flamingo Habitat. <clears throat> so we are going to go dark for now and we'll see you again at noon. So we have 26 flamingos here at Reed Park Zoo. They're split about evenly. We have 14 females and 12 males. And if you look at some of the behaviors you see, especially in the water, you may notice some flamingos are stomping their feet and moving their bill through the water. That is a natural foraging behavior. So that's how they find food in their natural habitat. They will be eating mostly algae and crustaceans. So tiny little crustaceans, like miniature shrimp or krill. 
And that's what they're going to be filtering out using their special beak. You may also see some of them standing on one leg. For us, standing one on one leg is kind of a balancing act. We really have to work at it. But for flamingos, that's actually more comfortable for them. Scientists used to think they were standing on one leg in order to help keep their bodies warm because sometimes they stand in very cold, cold water. And by keeping only one leg in the water, their other leg can be tucked up, tucked up against their body where their feathers can provide insulation. But now scientists believe it might just be easier for them because flamingos will also stand on one leg even if it's the end of April and it's 90 degrees in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. So obviously it's not just a way to stay warm. Now, if you take a look at those flamingos legs, especially the flamingos that are walking a little bit, it looks like their knees are bending backwards. But a bird's anatomy or structure is a little bit different than ours. What we are seeing bend backwards is actually their ankle joint. So a bird's knees are way up high at the very top of their legs. They're covered by the feathers. Their knees bend the same direction that ours do. And their ankles bend the, uh, bend the same direction that our ankles do. Their ankles are just much higher up on their legs. So let's see what other behaviors we see. I'm seeing a lot of resting, a lot of tired flamingos right now. So you'll see that their heads are tucked up against their backs. That is a comfortable resting flamingo. And here at Reed Park Zoo, that's something we're particularly pleased to see because when a flamingo feels comfortable enough to rest and relax, that means they're very comfortable in their new habitat. Here at the front of the zoo, it tends to be a little bit busier than where they were before at the very back. So these are the kind of behaviors we look for to know that we have content flamingos, flamingos that are just being flamingos here at the zoo. If you've come and visited them before, you may have seen them squawk at each other or, or kind of almost a little bit of an argument. That's also a natural flamingo behavior. They are social. They live in big groups called flocks, just like here at the zoo. And just like with our big families, sometimes they bicker back and forth a little bit. This time of year, the males and females are starting to separate out into mated pairs. So sometimes one flamingo might get a little bit too close to another pair and they say, hold off, you're not part of our special group right now. You're in my space, you need to back up a little bit. So it's great being able to come here to Reed Park Zoo and see some of these natural behaviors that would occur in their natural habitat. Now we're taking a really good look at some dabbling there. This pool that we see actually has several different depths. So in some areas, it's a little bit deeper. And in some areas, it's more shallow. That mimics their natural habitat, which are often salt flats, where there might be different levels of water throughout that salt flat. But it's also very open. So if you have seen our older flamingo habitat, you probably saw that there was lots of trees, a giant bush in the middle. That doesn't really mimic their natural habitat. Chilean flamingos are found in South America and they're found from near ocean level all the way up to over 10,000 feet up in the Andes mountains. So they're able to live in a lot of different elevations, a lot of different temperature ranges. So they can handle our heat, but they can also handle extreme cold, even snow. And in some places, the lakes where they may be found may also be frozen in spots, but they're able to still survive and find that food that they need to survive. So this new habitat really encourages natural behaviors. It looks more like a natural habitat for them. Now we've had a chance to see them just uh, do some of their natural behaviors. You may have noticed their feet also are webbed, kind of like a duck's feet. That not only allows them to swim, but it also helps them stir up the crustaceans and algae at the bottom of the water as they're eating. Now take a look at their bills. Their bills are kind of strange shaped, but the way a flamingo eats, it dips its head into the water and then it uses its tongue to push water out of its beak and it traps that krill inside. I happen to have a flamingo beak right here so we can kind of see it in action. So we have a flamingo skull 
And this flamingo skull, when the bird is upright, looks like this. But when it's feeding, it tips its head down and move that tag out of the way, just like that. And then it's able to push water out through that beak. Now it might be hard to tell, but I'm gonna try to move this beak even closer so you can see the ridges on the edge of the beak. These are called lamellae. Birds do not have teeth, teeth weigh a lot. So instead, some birds have these structures along the outside and that works kind of like a comb to help strain or like a strainer to help strain the water out, but keep the food inside. So that's what you're seeing those flamingos do. And then of course they stick that bill back up. Now I mentioned that we have Chilean flamingos here at Reed Park Zoo. Chilean flamingos are one of six species of flamingo that are found throughout the world. There's the greater and lesser flamingos that are found in Africa and parts of Asia. But in what we call the new world, North and South America, there are four species. Sometimes people come to Reed Park Zoo and they look at the Chilean flamingos and say, they're not as pink as I remember. That's because a lot of times people are thinking of the Caribbean flamingo. They're very, very bright pink. Chilean flamingos are a little bit paler with some red coloring and some black coloring. There's also the Andean flamingo, the James's flamingo, Chilean and Caribbean. So we have a total of six species that we share this planet with. Here at Reed Park Zoo, we have Chilean flamingos, but we also partner with the Andean Highland flamingo, but we not only partner with it, we are one of the co-leads for the Andean Highland flamingo. You might be thinking to yourself, but you only have Chilean flamingos here. Like I mentioned earlier, Chilean flamingos can be found at high altitude salt flats up in the Andes mountains. And some of that range overlaps or is shared with Andean flamingos and James's flamingos. And I have a little map to show you right here. I'm gonna to try to make it so there's not so much glare. If you look at this map right here, this range, it's in Chile, up in the mountains, is where the Chilean flamingo, the Andean flamingo, and the James flamingo are all found. We want to protect all three of those species of flamingo, and that's why the SAFE program, Saving Animals from Extinction, focuses on all three. One of the biggest threats to the flamingos in that region is climate change. So as temperatures are changing, there's longer and more intense dry periods. Flamingos require standing water in order to lay their eggs and reproduce. That's how they protect their eggs from nest predators. So they need water in order to create a breeding colony. Without water, not only can they not breed, but they have a harder time finding food. They have to move to new water sources. And one way we can help pr protect flamingos is actually by cutting down on how often we drive places. Driving obviously is important. That might be the only way we can go certain areas, but maybe riding our bikes more often, especially when the weather's nice and we don't have very far to go. That can help protect flamingo habitat in Chile and surrounding areas. Another way you can help flamingos is by using your phones or other like smart devices, tablets, as long as you possibly can, because we rely on lithium for a lot of our electronics. And one of the places that lithium is mined the most is in the same habitat these flamingos are found. So we wanna make sure that there's enough resources, not only water, but also food for these animals. And when we're mining, some of that food source gets disrupted. So the more we can hold on to our smartphones or our tablets, the better it will be for the areas that are mined for that lithium. We can also encourage companies to find ways to practice mining more sustainably. There's new technology out to help make sure that we can mine a little bit um, better where it doesn't use as much water. Because right now the process uses a lot of water and it's in an area where water is starting to decrease. So we might hear a little bit of squabbling now. It sounds like everybody's starting to wake up. 
and seeking out their individual spots in the habitat. So we'll take a look at them for a minute while we talk a little bit more about the Flamingo Safe. So Reed Park Zoo, like I mentioned, is a co-lead for the Andean Highlands Flamingo Safe program. And one thing that we're working on is learning more about how flamingos use the habitat that they are found. We know flamingos move from place to place. So we're actually learning where they're moving and what drives those migrations by using radio telemetry. So by learning how flamingos are using their habitats, we'll better be able to protect the spaces they rely on so they can continue into the future. Now, pretty much everybody knows what a flamingo is and how amazing they are. They're pretty iconic. We want to make sure they're around for, for many, many more years. Many more generations can experience them. Did we have any questions come through? Sorry, Kristen, I was muted. Um, yes, we had some uh, a really great observation that maybe you want to touch on. They noticed that their beak is black, but the rest of them is pink. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So bird coloration happens in two ways. One, there's pigments from their food. Or two, it's the way the light reflects off of their feathers. So if you see birds that have a lot of blues, it's not really the color of the feather. It's just the way we see the bird. But for flamingos, that pink color does come from their food. It comes from that krill and algae they're eating. Even though some of the algae they're eating is more of a blue-green algae, their body is able to process that chemical and deposit it as pink in its feathers. Now, the reason that only parts of the flamingo are pink is because that chemical is only processed in that way in certain areas of its body. So there's not gonna be pink coloration in that bill, but most of the feathers have that pink coloration as well as the joints. If you notice their, their ankles, their feet, and even though we can't see them, their knees have that dark pink coloration. So it just has to do with how the body processes those pigments. So really fascinating topic that I could probably talk an hour about bird feathers and coloration. And I know we don't really have an hour. So I think we have time for one more question that maybe came through before we move to our next spot. Uh, great, Kristen. So um, the other question kind of revolves around their setup that they have there. Since it's a new habitat, can you talk a little bit about the new habitat, maybe the water or the house um, and that type of uh, thing? Absolutely. So behind me is a giant building. This is a flamingo night house as well as a keeper area. So every single year, our animal care staff works together to round up the flamingos for their annual checkups. That's also when they get vaccines. So they get their annual shots. And in the past, we've had to kind of corral them using temporary barriers to get them together so we can get close eyes on them. Now we're able to move them into their night house and that way we can process them. We can give them their health checkups in a less stressful way. And that's really, really important. Plus, even though these guys do great in the heat here and they also do great in the cold because they're found at all those elevations, they do have the option to go inside if it ever gets a little chilly, which we know happens maybe once or twice down here. Now, if you look at the pillar that's in front of the building, that's actually a misting system. So it can be turned on and spray mist for the flamingos if they want some extra cooling. It's not currently on because they're hanging out in the shade and in their pool. You may notice there's a lot of grass on that side of the habitat, yet all the flamingos are on this side. They're still not sure how they feel about grass. Maybe it feels weird on their feet, but they seem to prefer the dirt which is great because when it comes to be breeding season, that's what they're gonna build their nest mounds out of is the dirt, not the grass. Now we'll move into the pool. This pool has a state-of-the-art filtration system. It's working really hard to keep up with the sun that we have beating onto it, but it will fully cycle this water every 26 minutes. So it is, even though the water doesn't look like it's moving, it's filtering through this filtration system. There's also a second 
pond, a second pool towards the back that hopefully you guys can see. That's a separate designated feeding pool. So flamingos, since they do feed or forage from the water, we will put their special flamingo chow in that pool for them to forage like they would naturally, but it helps to keep this big main pool a little bit cleaner. That's a great question. So many amazing features in this night, new habitat. All right, guys, I know we are running a little short on time. We are gonna see you guys again in 10 minutes um, for our next animal. Um, so we are gonna go dark for now. Thank you guys so much, see you soon. Hello everybody. Thank you for joining us for our virtual Earth Day celebration today. Hopefully you've had a chance to join us at some of our other habitats around the zoo, such as giraffe, lion, the pollinator garden, or the flamingo habitats. Here we are back at the Conservation Learning Center upstairs in our classroom because we're going to meet a couple of other animals as we learn more about some SAFE programs. If you're just joining us, SAFE stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. And it is an initiative from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums to work together to save species that are in danger of becoming extinct. So we've talked a little bit about the giraffe safe program, the lion safe program, our monarch and North American songbird safe programs, flamingo safe, and now we're going to learn about North American turtle safe program. Now here I have an ornate or western box turtle that is found right here in the Sonoran Desert. Now they're found throughout the western United States. If you live in the eastern United States, there's also eastern box turtles. But this is a native North American species, so it is part of the North American SAFE program. Now if you have ever been around ponds, you may have seen turtles. And it may seem like turtles are not actually threatened or they're not in danger of disappearing. But there are several different species of native turtles, turtles that are native to here in North America. There are some types of turtles that have become quite common in places where they should not be, such as red-eared sliders. That's often the most, uh, the most common turtle you find in ponds around cities and towns. And that's because people will buy them as pets and then release them out into ponds where they're not normally found. And they can actually wreak havoc on that ecosystem. They can displace or kind of outcompete where they do better than the native turtles that are normally found there, as well as having impacts on some of the other animals and the plants that live in that ecosystem. So one big part of North American Turtle Safe is making sure that you're a responsible pet owner. If you decide you want to provide a home for a turtle, first of all, make sure you get it in a place from a place that's a reputable source. So not somebody who's gone out and caught a turtle from the wild because some of those turtles are starting to disappear. In addition, if you decide to try to provide a home for a turtle, just know that a turtle the size of Sonora here can live to be up to 30 years old. That's a really big commitment for having a pet for that long. So you want to make sure you can care for them their entire lives so they don't end up getting released into a pond where they either may not survive or they may do so well that other animals may not survive. Now another thing that the North American uh, Turtle Safe Program is doing is relying on community scientists just like you and I to help save them. So here in Arizona, Arizona Game and Fish actually has a box turtle watch program because it's believed that even here in Arizona, turtles such as the Western box turtle are starting to disappear. We don't exactly know why. It could be because they're losing some of their habitat spaces. As people need more crops and they need more places to live, we're starting to expand into some of their habitats. Turtles, of course, don't move very quickly. They're pretty slow moving. They don't have to move fast because they have that wonderful shell to protect them. So it's hard for them to move from one area of suitable habitat to another. So they're sometimes having some difficulty finding places where they can find the food, water, and shelter that they need to survive. As community scientists, we can help conservation science out in the field anytime that we're walking somewhere where there might be a turtle. Now here around Tucson, 
Great box turtle habitat is found in the grassland area just southeast of here. So if you're hiking near the San Pedro River or, the, or even some of the other river systems or just around the Santa Rita Experimental Range just south of us, you may see a box turtle in its natural habitat. If you do, please let Arizona Game and Fish know by going to their website and reporting a sighting on their box turtle watch project. That way we know where they are so we know what places to protect. Citizen science is really important for protecting a lot of the animals that we share our homes with. Now, when we're talking about animals like turtles or songbirds like finches or sparrows or monarch butterflies, we have a big part in protecting the species and the habitats they live because a lot of the habitats where they're found are right around our own houses. Now I wanna make sure we have some time for questions about the turtle here in front of me, Sonora, before I move on to our next animal that we're going to meet. Were there any questions that came in, Andrea? Um, so one of the questions that came in is, can anything break their shell? Ooh, that's a great question. So most animals cannot bite through a turtle's shell. That shell is made out of a mixture of bone and keratin. Keratin is the same thing that is in our fingernails. So imagine fingernails over bony plates. So that's a very, very thick protection. Um, so not much can bite through. A coyote might be able to get pieces of the shell and get to some of the soft part of the turtle inside, but they mostly rely on stealth sneaking up on that turtle before it knows it's there. Now there is one animal that is found sometimes here in Southern Arizona, we have just a few, that is strong enough to bite through a turtle's shell and that is a jaguar. So jaguars are able to do so and alligators are able to do so. We don't have alligators here in Arizona. So really it's just the jaguar that can bite through a turtle's shell. So their shell provides great protection. Another question is, if you know, how many species of turtle are there? Oh my goodness. I do not know how many species of turtle there are throughout the whole world. I would guess over a hundred. Um, here in the Sonoran Desert area, we have fox turtles. We also have mud turtles and we have the desert tortoise that people are often familiar with. So we have a few different species here. There's probably more that I don't know about, um, but turtles are, um, they've been around for a very long time. So they've had a lot of time to develop into different species. Depending on where you are in North America, you may have up to 10 species native to your area. Great question. Another question is how can you tell males from females? So for most reptiles, it's really hard to tell a male from a female unless you're a herpetologist, which is a scientist who studies reptiles. For box turtles, there are two ways to tell. One way, when you see an adult box turtle, if that box turtle has red eyes, it's a male. If it has brownish yellow golden eyes, it's a female. So I'm gonna bring Sonora a little bit closer to the camera. So maybe you'll get a chance to see her eyes. You can definitely take a look at her. I wanna make sure it doesn't get too blurry, but she has those beautiful golden eyes. So she is a female. Now, if you look at the bottom or plastron of a box turtle shell, females have kind of a flat plastron. Males have a plastron that dips in a little, it's concave, so it looks kind of like this. That's another way you can tell, but it's hard to know if you're not very close. And because box turtles don't really want to be disturbed by people, it's best not to get close enough to tell. Um, if you do find a turtle and you're able to tell using binoculars, whether it's a male or a female, Arizona Game and Fish would love to know that. So you can let them know, but I recommend binoculars to tell. Great question. Do we have time for one more before we move on? All right. Um, so the last question will be, um, can turtles make noises? Ooh, it's not too often they do. Sometimes they might make a hissing sound. That's a noise they might make if they're startled. Beyond that, I haven't heard a turtle make a noise. So um, I don't know if anyone else has. Molly, have you heard a turtle make a noise? 
Um, not mm -hmm. startled. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. So maybe a hissing noise, just if they're startled. Usually that will happen as they're pulling into their shell. Great question. So I am going to put a special mask on now because our next animal is a little bit um, more susceptible to things like coronavirus. And I want to make sure they're protected. So we get this mask on. So we're ready for Brittany. And I'm going to step off the camera and angle it a little bit. All right. Go here we're going to give the next animal an opportunity to run around in this space. It's actually going to be two of them and we'll see how they like this particular area here because it's not one that they really get to spend a ton of time in. A friend of theirs though who also happens to live in the same room as them does spend a lot of time. He is a rather stinky animal just like them so they might be quite interested in what this smells like. Now, if you recognize this animal, feel free to send us a chat about them and let us know who you think they are. But these, if you are not familiar with them, are ferrets. Now, these are domesticated ferrets. These are not a wild species. This is one that you could potentially adopt as a pet. But one of the reasons we wanted to talk about them today is because they do have wild cousins that are threatened in the places they come from. And one in particular called the black-footed ferret. For those of you who live in Arizona, you might be familiar with the black-footed ferret because they are a native species. They can be found in the northern parts of our state and some of the neighboring states. But black-footed ferrets are an animal that almost went extinct. Back in the 70s, there were only about 18 of them left, and that was after researchers thought that we had lost them forever. It was a very lucky find for a rancher to quite literally stumble across a black-footed ferret because his dog happened to find one. Now, the reason the black-footed ferrets almost became extinct is because of their food source disappearing. One of the major threats that faces a number of different animals is going to be resource loss. So it could be prey depletion. And in the case of both lions, who we met earlier, and black-footed ferrets, that was absolutely the case. So prairie dogs are the primary source of food for black-footed ferrets. And prairie dogs are not necessarily a welcome sight in a rancher's territory. So if they have cattle that they are trying to graze open range, they don't really want to have a prairie dog town because that is going to be a lot of different holes in the ground that could cause their cattle to stumble and become injured. Since they do not want those animals in their area, they will do whatever it takes to sometimes get rid of them. And by getting rid of a population of animals, that is going to affect every other animal in their ecosystem. For Black-footed ferrets, that eliminated their food source, and that meant that they were going to not have any opportunity to find a different food source. When things happen in a short period of time, animals don't always have the opportunity to adapt. Luckily though, by finding that one black-footed ferret, the colony, the rest of them, and the areas they were found were also located, and that's where zoos came in. One of the most important functions that zoos have is conservation. So by stepping in and relocating the rest of those black-footed ferrets to human care, we were able to successfully reproduce more black-footed ferrets. By doing genetic testing, by trying to separate everybody as much as possible to keep that genetic line open and healthy, we were able to successfully reproduce and get black-footed ferrets back out into the wild. Today, there are more than 300 of them in their home range again. And there are estimated to be as many as a thousand in human care, which is really incredible for a species that was right on the brink of disappearing. Now, black-footed ferrets are going to look very similar to our two ferrets here. This is Dimitri and Nadia. Dimitri is the one looking kind of up in the air here. Nadia is facing the camera a little bit. They are brother and sister, but they are very different sizes because males do tend to be a little bit larger than females. When you look at Dimitri, he's actually very close in size to what a wild black-footed ferret would look like. But black-footed ferrets, as it suggests in their name, do have little black feet. They also tend to have a black mask. So they look quite a bit different from domesticated ferrets, but they all share that long, lean body. The reason they have that is because as a hunter of an underground species, an animal that likes to live in tunnels, they need to be able to fit inside of those tunnels to get their prey. They also need to be able to bend around inside of that tunnel to be able to get their prey back out safely. 
they don't want to leave the tunnel with their hind end first because they are not able to see or hear anything that might be waiting outside of the tunnel for them. So instead, they can fold their bodies perfectly in half, as Dimitri is kind of showing off to you right there, to be able to pull their prey out with them and head out face first. Now, you might have noticed that they are both rolling around a fair bit. They are doing some scent marking, so making sure that their companion friend, who they haven't ever really met, have only smelled, knows that they have been here. He is a very stinky animal. He is one of our other ambassadors here at the zoo. And as stinky animals themselves, ferrets like to let everybody know that a space belongs to them by rubbing their bodies all over that area. So they have special scent glands and a nice musky odor that they leave behind to just broadcast to everyone who has been here and what they've been up to. So while we enjoy watching them, we're gonna pause and see if anybody has any questions about either our ferrets or black-footed ferrets. One question I came through is where are the ferrets in the zoo? Where are the ferrets in the zoo? So the ferrets live behind the scenes. They are in our conservation learning center. And as ambassador animals, they spend a lot of time going to programs like this one, and also a number of different animal encounters or virtual school programs right now. When we are in person, they can do several programs in person a day and meet a lot of people. So by living behind the scenes, they get that opportunity for a break where it's nice and quiet and nobody is going to be peeking in at them. All right, that's the only thing. All right. Um, and do they play a lot? Sorry, Brittany, there was one more. Do they play a lot? Do they play a lot? Absolutely. Ferrets are very, very active animals when they want to be. They kind of have two speeds. They are either up and bouncing, exploring, doing all sorts of different things, possibly getting into mischief. If you have ferrets at home or if you've known anybody with ferrets, they do like to steal things and kind of hide them away in little hidey holes. So keys, socks, Anything shiny, anything jingly, those are all a lot of fun. Anything cozy that they can cuddle up into, those are all fair game to a ferret. But they do love to play and interact with each other. This is a very social animal. So having more than one is great for their overall health. And they will dance together. At least it's called dancing. It looks like dancing. It's them kind of bouncing around, rolling around, doing some play fighting, some play wrestling, which is all natural, normal behaviors and something that is a lot of fun to watch. But when they're not playing, they are usually sound asleep. And then do they bite? Do they bite is our other question. Absolutely anything with a mouth could bite. So that is our rule at the zoo. It's a very good one to follow just in life in general. Ferrets do have pretty extraordinarily sharp teeth as small carnivores. They may not have big mouths or big teeth, but it doesn't matter because they do still have sharp, powerful jaws that can potentially cause some damage. So they could absolutely bite. Our ferrets are usually pretty good about it. They typically only play bite with each other, but we are really respectful of the fact that they're a pretty strong little animal in their own right. Um, I think we only have time for two more questions. So, oh, right. Um, do people think they're cute? <laughs> and uh, can animals trick them? Do people think they're cute? Well, I don't know about you guys, but I think they're extraordinarily cute. So I would say yes. Um, they are quite an endearing and adorable little animal. And do other animals, can animals, hurt can animals hurt them? You know what, absolutely they could. This is a small animal. And even though they are predators, they could still be prey for something larger than them. So in their home habitats, if we're talking about black footed ferrets, that could be birds of prey, coyotes, bobcats, um, potentially even stray dogs or cats, although they're usually pretty far out and away from people, but anything larger than they are could see them as a potential snack. If we're talking about some of their cousins, so the other relatives in their family, such as weasels, stoats, and otters, those are all animals that, again, they are predators, but they could still be prey to something bigger than they are. So little animal like this does have to watch their back at all times. And luckily for ferrets, they can bend themselves in half to do that. So they can watch their own backs. All right, I think that probably takes care of all of our questions. So we will leave you with a last glimpse of our ferrets and remind you that we are moving over to our jaguar habitat next. So if you are inclined to stay with us, if you want to join us, we will come back to you in just about 10 minutes at one o'clock over at Jaguar. Back to our virtual Earth Day celebration. We are standing at our jaguar habitat right now, our keepers, have just put out some enrichment for Bella, our jaguar. We're actually following one of our keepers as she adds to the enrichment. 
Now, enrichment is something you may have heard us mention a couple of times today. I believe that word has come up. It is basically anything we can do in an animal's habitat that would change their space. So anything that's going to change it from one day to the next, and it can come in a variety of different forms. So enrichment that you just saw coming out was a toy, so a tactile item, something they could touch, and they can also add some food to that as well. So some of the things that are going out for Bella today are toys, but also a little bit of food in the bottom of the blue bucket in her pool. It's at the very bottom of your screen right now. Enrichment can also come in the form of different scents. Some of our animals have incredibly well-developed senses of smell. So being able to put different types of scents in their habitat is really enriching for them to explore, to understand what they are, to try and filter them through those incredible noses of theirs to understand exactly what it is and kind of break it down in their minds to see what's what. Now here comes the star of our show today. This is Bella, our female jaguar. We actually just celebrated her birthday not too long ago. She just recently turned 12. So she is making her way over to her enrichment here. Now you may have noticed that she was kind of considering going in the water. Jaguars are one of the cats that are well known for exploring water and utilizing it not only for cooling off or enjoying it, but also for hunting. Jaguars are incredibly powerful swimmers. They have been known to swim into water sources to be able to catch food. Anything from turtles and fish all the way up to something the size of a caiman, which is a species of in the alligator and crocodilian family. Now up to, it's up to Bella how exactly she gets her enrichment. And that's one of the best things about enrichment. It is something that it exercises their minds and their bodies. Bella is doing an incredible job of both right now. You can see she's got really great balance on those hind legs there. That tail is going to act as an extra bit of balance for her. It allows her to brace herself, to run really quickly, to climb trees. Right now it's helping kind of counter her weight as she's stretching down into the water. And she's using her front paws very similarly to how we would use them to try and grab a hold of the food that is waiting for her inside. She can smell it. She can probably feel what is in there. So by touching it with her paws, she was able to kind of get a sense of what's underneath. So her paws are very, very sensitive and they actually have some whiskers on the backs of them to help her out. But she is doing a lot of problem solving right now. She knows there's something really great in there. She just has to decide what the best way is to go ahead and get a hold of it. Now, jaguars are an apex predator in their ecosystems. And if you were not familiar with them, this is a cat that is found in the Americas. They are actually the largest cat found in the Americas and the third largest cat species in the world. A lot of times they are confused with leopards. Leopards are another very large, beautiful spotted cat, but leopards are from Africa and they actually have a slightly different spot pattern than our jaguar here. So everybody does have rosettes. Good job, Bella. She was able to get her part of her enrichment out of there. We'll see if she can actually get it back off of her foot because she has a hold of the food treat that's inside. There we go. Now she's doing some more problem solving here. She's going to take off with her toy. So inside of that is her food treat. That is why that became a very important item for her to grab. Now, again, jaguars are the largest cat found in the Americas. They are larger than pumas or mountain lions as they are also known. This is an animal that can range all the way from the central parts of South America, north even into the southern parts of our state. So as we enjoy watching Bella here, she is using that incredible brain of hers to figure out how to get her food treat out from inside of a different form of enrichment. So this enrichment is definitely twofold here. And that is really, really great for her to be able to use a lot of different senses and a lot of different muscles. This is a puzzle now. So she's exercising her brain just as much as she's exercising her body. And she's showing off some of the things that jaguars are very, very good at. Like all cats, they are going to be very good at using their paws to be able to manipulate things around them. Now their paws are not going to quite be the same as our hands. They do not have opposable thumbs. So that is a slight disadvantage that they have. But you know what? You would never know that it puts them at any kind of a disadvantage because it just doesn't seem to bother them at all. She of course has decided to go behind our log structure there. We'll see if she comes back out the other side. Hopefully she will. But by looking at that log structure, that is another highlight of her and her adaptations. Something that we are going to use in her habitat to be able to help her continue to exercise and behave the way a jaguar would in the wild. I just saw a question pop up in the chat that is perfect for this. Do they climb trees? 
Absolutely. They are very, very good at climbing trees. They are one of the cats that are known to sometimes take prey up into a tree. The one that is best known for that is the leopard in Africa. And again, another beautiful spotted cat, slightly smaller than the jaguar. And their rosettes are different. They do not have the extra spot in the middle of their rosette. But just like the leopard, jaguars are spectacular climbers. They will sometimes ambush animals from the trees, just like a leopard would. So one of their hunting strategies that has been observed is climbing up into a tree and jumping down onto an animal that is underneath them. Jaguars are also one of the most powerful of the uh, mouths in the world. So Sam is gonna help us out and bring a skull right into the front of our screen there. So that model skull is a model of a jaguar skull. They are one of the most powerful sets of jaws in the animal kingdom. And jaguars are going to be an animal that hunts by catching an animal by its skull. So they are going to be able to crush bone. And you can kind of see there with those incredibly sharp teeth, they've got those canines up front. Along the sides there, those are carnasial teeth. So those are the slicing teeth that cats have in order to slice off chunks of meat. Those big, big bones that are kind of curving out towards you on the sides there. As Sam turns it, you'll be able to see them off to the side. So those are where their muscles attach. That is what gives them their power. They are often given credit for being the second strongest jaws in the mammal kingdom. Number one is going to be the spotted hyena. And number two is typically the jaguar. Every once in a while they flip flop though. It kind of depends on who you ask. But these animals are incredible predators. They are known to eat over 80 different species of animal in their habitats where they come from. And they can range from tropical forests, so the Amazon forest, and all the way up into our deserts here in Southern Arizona. So these are animals that are really, really critical to be able to protect. Right now we are as an AZA community, so as the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we are working to develop a Jaguar Saving Animals from Extinction program, so a Jaguar Safe. And part of what we are hoping to do is increase their ability to get to each other. Jaguars do not have any subspecies, unlike some other types of animals. When we talked about our giraffe earlier today, there are a number of different subspecies of giraffe that can all kind of intermingle with each other. And we are seeing a lot of that in the wild as their populations and as their habitats change. Jaguars do not have that. It is only the Panthera unca. There she goes. She might go back inside. We're hoping she'll bring her food over to us. So they are all one species and we need to make sure that they can get to each other. So by making sure that we have wildlife corridors, safe places for these jaguars to roam freely, that is going to be one of the most critical things that we can do in order to help them out. Now you get a great view of Bella on the side there. So you can see that incredible pattern of hers. You can zoom in on her beautiful face and some of those adaptations, those other features that are going to allow her to be a successful predator, such as those very, very large teeth that you saw in that model skull. Now with her color pattern, she is going to be completely unique with her spots. All spotted cats are going to have a unique pattern, just like human fingerprints, just like the giraffe we talked about earlier today. Now, as Bella enjoys her treat here, we're going to pause and see if we have any questions that have come through that Andrea has not already answered for us. Uh, again, we invite you to visit our website at reedparkzoo.org and you can um, have the opportunity to um, uh, learn more of the activities that we have posted on the website and we'd love to see your submission. So um, if you choose to do the bird friendly habitat or build a nature bee house or some of the art activities and other activ uh, scavenger hunts that we have on there, we'd love to see uh, your family getting out and enjoying nature um, and really celebrating the planet that we live on.